Hey, uh, I usually don't present in this room or with this camera, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Emperor uh, Qin, Shi Huang Di. Uh, he was the emperor who was given credit for um, founding the, or solidifying or consolidating China under one rule. Uh, Qin was alive, and you see down there, from 259 BC to 210 BCE. Uh, his dynasty didn't last very long without him. It only lasted another four years after he died. Now, Qin, he is one of the kings of one of the warring states during the warring states period. Uh, one of my students, I forget who it was, mentioned that the Zhou dynasty lasted until 4 or 221. Uh, in the book, it says 475, and he is right. He was in the seventh period. I remember who it was now. Now, what happened with the Zhou? Um, they probably had these feudal kingdoms or satraps. Uh, and I have a couple of vocab words in there. But these feudal kingdoms would be smaller kingdoms that ruled with the Zhou Emperor's blessing. And they probably became too powerful. Uh, feudalism is something that we'll see in Japan when you guys look at that. Um, I don't know if a lot of time this year. But it's also in the Middle Ages in Europe. And it's where the king separates his land or splits his land up with his feudal lords. And the lords will control the land uh, with the king's blessing. And when the king decides to go to war, the, the feudal lords must provide the army. Uh, and so there's a give and take relationship. But in this, in China, it looks like feudalism stopped under Emperor Qin. Because later on it talks about how he banned those state traps and banned those feudal lords. He didn't want anyone to become too powerful. Japanese feudalism is, is fascinating, and there are some parallels between um, what Chin does and what the Japanese do later on. What is fascinating is Emperor Shi Huangdi became emperor uh, at age 13. Now, initially, his mom, I'm not sure if it's his mom, it could be his kind of like stepmom, but Lu, Bei, Lu Bu Wei uh, was the concubine of his father. Now, a concubine is a secondary wife, uh, but not quite a wife. Uh, frequently, in ancient times, people could have multiple wives, and sometimes they could have concubines beyond that. Uh, so she's not quite a wife, but more than a girlfriend. And she probably had uh, Shi Huangdi as one of her sons, possibly. We aren't quite sure if it is exactly his mom or not. But his father was being held hostage by the Joe. And that is a typical way you keep control of your feudal lords. That you take some of their family members and hold them hostage so that the king doesn't do anything to revolt against the kingdom. Or the feudal lord doesn't revolt against the kingdom. But um, Shi Huangdi became emperor at age 13 while his father was being held um, hostage by the Joe. And it doesn't look like he was too concerned about his father's well-being because he started to work towards independence. Now, Lu Bu Wei, uh, his stepmom, we'll call her, she was his regent. She helped rule the country with him or for him while he was young. Now, it says here in 238 BCE or BC, uh, he exiled officials. When I look at the timeline over here, the timeline is not misleading, but it doesn't have the, the entire truth. Um, it talks about these officials who ruled in his name, and they don't mention that it was a woman who was the concubine of his father. Um, women didn't typically have a lot of social power uh, back in ancient China. In fact, next week we'll look at the, how men and women and the role of society went on. But women didn't have a lot of power. Um, China was a patriarchy where men were the most important people. And so to have a woman be the, the regent who rules for a son is pretty, pretty impressive. We'll see this again when we get to Egypt. Some of the queens in Egypt would actually be uh, regents for their younger sons. Uh, and it's, it's pretty cool to see women exercise that power. Now in 238 BC, it says he exiles the officials whom he suspects of plotting against him and rules alone. 
The officials who were ruling or tried to plot against him may have been his mom's boyfriend uh, because he has his mom's boyfriend executed and then he throws his mom in jail, uh, puts her in exile, so she has no control over him anymore. From that point on, he rules by himself. It is so fascinating to look at ancient history and modern history to see those fa family dynamics uh, all the way through Peter the Great in Russia. He has, um, he's the son of a second mother or second wife, but he has that family dynamic too where they exile each other and, and aren't too nice to each other. But you can see this in many of the royal families throughout Europe and also Asia. Uh, it, it's, again, good drama. Now, 227 BC, he, uh, there are some assassination attempts against him. Now, assassination, whoa, I didn't want that to happen. Assassination attempts, they uh, tried to kill him, and it almost worked out, but it also had a different effect on him because it looks like he became paranoid. If, he, if they tried to kill him and got close, he started to get very defensive. We will see a lot of movements in history where emperors, kings, presidents will become paranoid or, or defensive when somebody tries to move against them. Uh, the Cold War is somewhat that, where after World War II, the United States really grew our defenses because we thought we were threatened by the Soviet Union. Um, so, uh, Xi Huangdi, he was, they tried to assassinate him, and so he started to push his defenses out and make sure that he held control. Uh, one way, too, that countries will do this is they will actually invade other countries around them to make sure that they control all the countries, even their enemies on their border, and push their enemies further out. And um, that's what Xi Huangdi seemed to have done, because by 221 BCE, he has control of China. He has defeated the other six rival kingdoms. And that's what, oh, we don't see that quite yet. That's the next slide after this one. As he pushes these countries out, he is very legalistic. Now, legalism is a philosophy in China. Uh, legalism is where you, it says here, you have excessive adherence to the law. Uh, it's black and white. Okay, If you break the law, you must pay the price. And frequently, legalistic societies will have harsh punishments. Death is almost uh, the punishment for everything. But these are some of the adjectives I saw associated with Xi Huangdi, a despot. Now, a despot is a ruler who holds absolute power. Um, in our current situation, we typically call dictators. They could be despots. Uh, but even dictators, so we have dictators across the world, and we'll have to look at those people sometime. Um, Putin of Russia is often called a dictator, and I can't think of the Nicaraguan president right now. It is, oh, I almost had his name, but he is considered a dictator. Fidel Castro of Cuba was a dictator. Uh, president Xi of um, China, even though he is elected and they have a Republican government, a lot of people look at the government of China and say that is a dictatorship. And there are arguments to be made. Uh, you know, we would have to define what a dictator is and see if he is a despot or not, but to see if they have absolute control or not. Um, and again, that's, it would be something we could actually debate about different countries and different time frames. Now, he was also draconian. Now, draconian means excessively harsh or severe. Um, Draconian laws, if you do something wrong, they get you. Uh, something that's draconian that we will see in the Middle East is when you steal, you have your hand chopped off. Um, but a lot of times, some of these laws, you know, death is it. Death or mutilation, where they scar you, they do something to your body so you can't do it again. They also call them a villain. And this is interesting because when someone's a villain, it says the definition here is someone who has evil actions or motives. Almost anyone can be considered a villain because uh, many world leaders do things that might lead to, you know, they have to make decisions. Who do we protect? Who do we sacrifice? And so there are decisions that world leaders will make that actually end in the death of different people. 
maybe not intentionally, but then if you want to call them evil, you have to look at their motives. Um, did they intend it? Was it something that was, um, you know, like they plotted this out or something? And so villainism is something that is kind of, we could judge that too, to see if someone is a despot or, or a dictator. Now, inhuman, be careful about calling someone inhuman. Um, in the definition, it says lacking compassion or mercy and cruel or barbaric. Now, barbaric, barbaric has a civilization connotation to it. Um, the Greeks called the people to the north barbarers, or barbarians. Uh, the Russians called the Germans Nemets, which means barbarian in Russian. And so you have these words that call people barbarians. And it's often referred to as a civilization. Now, a civilization that is a barbarian civilization, okay, oftentimes it has racist overtones or ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is where you take your own ethnic group and say that my group is better than your group. But I can go with the cruel, barbaric, and I can also say lacks compassion or mercy. But if you're using barbaric in terms of a civilization or in reference to a civilization, that is where it goes from a, a good adjective to an adjective that could have racist overtones to it. And I don't want to go that direction. Uh, so you could say that Xi Huangdi is cruel, that he is not merciful, uh, that he has no compassion, but don't say that his culture or his people are barbaric because when you take a barbaric, when that takes that turn, it, it just can get messy pretty quickly. So be careful with that word. Superstitious. Now, uh, Shi Huangdi also had these superstitions. And I tried to find a, a better definition for superstition. Irrational is probably the best one. Um, and we probably could go through examples of what superstitions are. Now, one thing that he is also known for is creating a bureaucracy and central administration. And so he wiped out those feudal lords and outlawed those individual satrapies because he wanted control. And then he created, and I don't have it here, but he created 36 different military districts and civil districts where you had a military person and a civil person in charge of those districts that were answerable to him, but they didn't have any control of it on their own. Then, then he also took the aristocratic families and moved them to the capital, uh, Xi'an Yang. Um, and that way, those people would not raise their own army and rebel against them. Okay? He held them very close to himself. In Japan, the emperor, or the, in Japan, it was the shogun that ruled the country. And the shogun re required the lords, the aristocratic, aristocratic families, to send the, the lords would send their families to Tokyo to live with the shogun. So the lord out in his own little personal estate would never raise an army to attack the shogun because he would first lose his family. So hostages are something that is um, taken at this time. And you could probably consider those people, those aristocrats, as hostages. Uh, now he also, oh, there it is. He d did divide the country into 36 military districts and put government officials in charge of them. This is, doesn't seem like it's much, but you standardize weights and measures. When you standardize your weights and measures and you make sure all the axle, um, axles on the wagons are the same width, uh, it enhances commerce because if you go somewhere to buy something, you want to make sure that you are buying the correct amount. If you've ever gone to the gas station with one of your parents, uh, they'll have a sticker on the gas pump that says that this has been validated by the state of Washington, uh, that, that is pumping out exactly a gallon of fuel uh, when you buy it. That way we have trust. Okay. And you can trust that the people are actually selling you what you're buying. Uh, in Europe, uh, if you go to these small towns, they would frequently have the weights and measures right there uh, in their town square. In Pompeii, in ancient Rome, they would have the bulls that would measure out the bushels. They would have the, the stones that would be the same weight as what you were buying. And so you could actually go check to see if you were given the correct amounts. 
Now he also built defensive networks, and that turns into the, what is known as the Great Wall of China. Uh, there is that Great Wall of China. Uh, now, when you see pictures, okay, this is a picture from our textbook. When you see pictures, you've got to ask yourself, is this realistic? Um, millions of people worked on the Great Wall of China, maybe not all at once or all at one spot, but they would come and serve. Frequently, the farmers were required to serve as laborers for a portion of their um, payment and taxes. Uh, there are legends that there are bodies buried inside the Great Wall. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I'm sure there could be some. Um, but when you look at pictures like this, okay, remember, this is not a picture taken from 2,200 years ago. This is a drawing that someone did about 10 years ago. And this is what they thought it would look like. Now, it might have some accurate things in here when you look at the, the weapons they have, uh, the umbrellas, the hats, the clothing. These things might have some accuracy, but you should always question, is this legitimate? Does this have information that is something that I could use? Or is it just totally fanciful? Is it someone's imagination? Uh, this is a picture of the Great Wall of China. Uh, before he built the Great Wall of China, there were walls. He connected many of the walls. Okay? He was born in the Warring States period, where you had these seven kingdoms fighting with each other. And as he took them over, he uh, took over their defense networks, too, and added to them. Now, in 220 BC, he starts an imperial tour. Uh, when we get to Rome, we'll see Emperor Hadrian do the same thing, where he tours the entire border region to see if people need to be put in place there. It's kind of an inventory. You know, how do things look? Or do we need more walls? Do we need more security? He also consolidated and organized that empire to make sure his 36 military districts were operating the same systems that he was. He paid homage to the gods. Now, in China and Japan, the Far East, typically the spirits or the gods are local. And so when you come into a city, they'll have local deities. In Japan, it's called Shintoism. And so there are local spirits that you, gotta, you must honor. Um, and I believe in China, with Buddhism being their primary religion, and by this time they are probably mostly Buddhist, but they also have these philosophies, Taoism. Uh, Taoism started about 500 BCE. Uh, we also have these legalistic philosophies, where you know, legalism is where he wants harsh punishments. And so you have these philosophies that are floating around China. And China is also an ancestor worship place where you honor your ancestors. Um, that's very similar to Japan. Okay? Shintoism is honoring your ancestors as well, where you honor the deities that have gone on before you. But anyhow, he'd go to these local places, honor his ancestors, honor the ancestors of that location with different rituals. Uh, but also what he was doing is he was searching for an alchemist. Alchemy is where you try to combine different materials. In his case, he was trying to find something that would help him live forever. Kind of ironic because one of those things actually killed him later on. But the Confucian scholars, okay, Confucianism is another uh, philosophy uh, where the philosopher Confucius advocated that scholars or that um, the government be run by scholars, by experts. And all throughout China and the Far East, down in the Vietnam, uh, you would have tests for scholars to become civil servants to work in the government. Anyhow, they criticized uh, Shi Huangdi for him looking for these magical people. And uh, as an example of his being very legalistic, he burned 460 of them, killed them. Uh, he didn't want to be criticized at all. Okay. Uh, typically, people who don't want to hear criticism, they often build what's called a cult of personality around themselves. If an emperor, a king, a dictator, a president, anyone that says, don't criticize me, if they can squash that criticism, frequently they're trying to build a cult of personality around themselves. Uh, you guys are too young for this, but 20 years ago uh, in the second Gulf War, 
many of the statues to Saddam Hussein were taken down. Saddam Hussein had built a cult of personality to himself in Iraq. Um, in the old Soviet Union, they had many of these large statues to the, the communist dictators. Lenin was one, Stalin, all these people. And Stalin was very good. He was the president, actually they called him the general secretary, but he's also retired. He didn't even have a title. But he ruled the Soviet Union from about 1928 to about 1953. Um, and you couldn't say anything negative, negative about him. Okay, Shi Huangdi was probably similar to this, where if you criticize him, watch out, because he's not going to let you do that. Now, eventually, he became more distrustful of the people around him. And he, there, I finally my guy. Um, he didn't even trust the, his closest advisors. And he, living in these palaces by himself, became almost godlike, okay, semi-divine. And so he was detached from his people, didn't trust people. He was very paranoid, uh, still was trying to seek something that would help him live forever. And eventually, one of those things that he, he was trying to take to make him live forever killed him. So in 210 BC, he died. And he was buried in this gigantic tomb uh, that he'd actually begun planning and working on when he first became emperor at age 13. Um, in that tomb, you have the terracotta soldiers, an army of people to follow him into the afterlife to protect him. Um, it, I've never been to this part of China, but I'd love to go to Xi'an and see these terracotta warriors. It would be fascinating. Um, Okay, those are my sources. If you have any questions, shoot me an email and I'll have the assignment next to this. Good luck.